Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's a great to be here at the Forum on Oncology. And uh, it's a great honor for me to, to share our ideas, what we have in Utrecht with, with you here. Um, this is uh, our center in Utrecht. It's one of the major academic hospitals. Um, and, uh, but before I want to dive into the, the depth of radiotherapy with you, I think it's a very nice to be in a sort of tradition of collaboration, collaboration between Utrecht or Moby broadly stated the Netherlands and St. Petersburg, and actually you want to draw your attention actually on something completely different outside radiotherapy. Because you know all this, probably the story about Peter the Great, but actually there's another example which I think, for me actually was very inspiring and I found out only recently, that this guy that is called in Dutch Wiege Berkhoff, he was born in the late 18th century in a village nearby my own village where I come from, so that's why I, I took this example. And he was part of, an, uh, of a Dutch community here in St. Petersburg that spent here for centuries in, uh, in St. Petersburg. And uh, he went as a kid already to St. Petersburg and he was educated in shipbuilding here. And he, he did a great career in shipbuilding here in St. Petersburg and he became Russian somewhere in his 20s. He married a Russian wife and he died actually as Vasily Berkov. So maybe, I don't know if you know him, but actually he, wa he became the director of Admiralty Shipyard here in St. Petersburg. So he contributed immensely to the development of shipbuilding here in St. Petersburg. So I think this is a very nice example and I don't, wanna, I'm st I don't stand nearly in the light of this guy, but I'm f it's great to be part of this continuing tradition of exchange of ideas. By the way, they went walking. <laughs> From, from Holland to St. Petersburg. It's about uh, four, 400, uh, 400 hours walking, if you're interested. Okay. Uh, um, a little bit about the content of my talk. I want to share a little bit with you what's the current radiotherapy process in Utrecht. Uh, and then I want to focus more my presentation on where can we improve in the radiotherapy process. And I want to highlight the role of MRI uh, for this purpose. I will, I will tell a bit something, oh, sorry. I will tell a little bit about uh, an MRI CT simulation workflow, something what Ilya already touched upon, and, uh, and, and share with you some initial uh, experience uh, going towards MRI only simulation for prostate. So, I think you all know there has been a revolution in the last 10, 15 years in terms of technology and radiotherapy. What we can do nowadays to shape beams is, 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 is of course, surpasses everything we did 20, 30 years ago. And that's thanks to certain key technologies. Uh, here, I give you an example of, uh, of what you can do in terms of beam shaping. We have, of course, imaging now. CT imaging allows 3D uh, images of the human anatomy that we can use to do computerized planning. And we have, uh, for example, here on the linear accelerator, we have a portal imaging device that allows us to, to image the given dose, but also use that for position verification to make sure that the patient is in the right location. This has led to the current workflow in Utrecht, how we do that. Uh, this is standard. So, of course, we have the imaging here it's, it's, it's where the whole workflow starts. Then the, these images are being uh, uh, presented to a clinician. A clinician has to delineate the target structures. It could be the tumor, the, the gross tumor volume, the GTV. And it could also be organ at risk. The dose is prescribed. Then it goes to a computerized dose planning process. A dose is being calculated. This is a head and neck case. And then this, this beam plan has to be replicated on the LINAC for a number of times. This, I think, is, is probably something you do in your own clinic too. And uh, this is also our workhorse, let's say, workflow. Now, what have we in Utrecht about uh, in terms of infrastructure? Uh, our big bore CT is actually the imaging work, workhorse. It's very robust, it's fast, provides excellent image quality, it's, it's a big board, it means that uh, it facilitates actually uh, imaging of patients in treatment position, which, which I think is very important. 
it comes with positioning lasers and has a very robust flat table. It's a similar graded table as we have on a Linux. For our treatment planning, we have an Alecta Monaco system. It's Monte Carlo based treatment planning. We do various techniques, IMT and VMAT, for example. In terms of linear accelerators, we all have Alecta linear accelerators equipped with small leaf agility uh, MLCs. We have uh, uh, megavolt imaging here, and we have most of our Linux have a cone beam CT used for, for position verification. So this is an example of what you can do with this. Uh, this is something we developed over the, let's say, the last uh, five years, seven years. Um, this is, a, again, a case of head and neck. And head and neck, often there's the toxicity xerostomia, which means that the, these people don't provide, uh, don't produce enough saliva after radiation. And that's because often in all plants, the, sal uh, the salivary glands were in, uh, in the radiation beam. Now, the use of CT together with IMT, you can make now very nice conformal dose distribution. And you, for example, control laterally, you can spare these glands such that uh, the saliva production is not compromised. Then I wanted to explain something of how do we do position verification. This is an example for prostate cancer where we use gold fiducials. These gold fiducials are implanted in the prostate one week before imaging. We use three gold fiducials. They are implanted transperineally. Oh, sorry. Uh, let's go back. Sorry for that. They are very small, five millimeters in length. And then these, these, uh, these, these markers you can uh, detect on CT. So that position is being detected. And then in the planning process, we create beams, eyes, views uh, on how it would look on the megavolt imaging. So this actually, this is done in the treatment planning. Here you see the beam at a certain angle. And here you see how the bony anatomy and the seats needs to be seen on the Linux on that angle. And that we, of course, compare with the online imaging, the megavolt imaging we do during prior to fraction. Then you also have an image. So this is an image synthetically generated from the CT in the planning process. And this is an online uh, uh, acquired image where you see part of the bony anatomy and the fiducials. This actually is a megavolt image. And what you then can do is of course compare and align to make sure that the, that the seats uh, during that fraction are actually in the same position as it is assumed in the planning process. Thus, you replicate uh, correctly the plan. And we can uh, do that in online correction to make sure that that, uh, that is the case. More and more, we use comb beam. Uh, the example I gave previous is for prostate. But for other cases, uh, other sites like uh, head and neck uh, or even uh, esophagus or pancreas, we use comb beam uh, guidance. And then, of course, you have this uh, orthogonal to the megavolt image. You have kilovolt imaging. And you can make images like that where you can see bony anatomy. The soft tissue contrast is, is, is of lesser quality than standard CT. But it suffices to do uh, position verification. So this is a bit about what we are standing, what's state of the art in Utrecht. And we're now looking actually in, uh, in various directions to improve uh, upon this workflow. And that's important, I think, because what you see now more and more, that people go towards hyperfractionation. Less fractions are being used. Instead of, for example, 35 fractions, what we now do for prostate, we are moving to five fractions. And then, of course, it's very important to realize where the errors enter in your workflow. Because the requirements with respect to accuracy becomes much more stringent. Now, then you have to sort of discriminate between errors that enter in your simulation process, which means delineation errors, uh, potential errors in your, in your beam planning, uh, whatever, geometrical errors in your imaging, 
they will enter as a systematic error. So each time that error will appear in the radiation, for example, if you do a misalignment of your target, each time you will radiate the target in a not correct way. So this is a systematic error. If you look at delivery, of course, there the errors are different. In this, this old paradigm where you have 35 fraction, random errors in position verification would average out. And you all actually only had a systematic error. But now, if we go to less fraction, four or five, this is no longer the case. So also the requirements with respect to position verification increases. And actually you can think about a, another paradigm which I will share with you in my second part of the presentation, where you would do actually online planning based on the daily anatomy you see. So you move away from this, this dogma of trying to replicate the plan uh, designed in the, in the in simulation process, but you really do online planning. Now, now I want to focus more on this, in this first part of my presentation on the simulation part. Where in this is part is the, the source of the largest uh, uncertainty. People have looked at this and it's not surprising to see actually that the main source of uncertainty is where the manual interaction takes place. Uh, clinicians have to define somewhere a target structure. And this turns out to be a crucial step. And people have looked at this in prostate and head and neck and various people have shown that actually the target definition is the major source of error in both tumor sites. So now I want to focus a little bit, what can we do in terms of imaging to improve this? Now we know that CT is nice, it's robust, uh, it's geometric accurate, it provides some soft tissue contrast, but it's not optimal. In terms of uh, uh, sensitivity for tumors, for example, it's often in an indirect way. And uh, if you combine, for example, PET and CT, you can just do a much better tumor visualization, as I've shown in this example here. Now, moving towards MRI, you see that if you compare contrast-enhanced MRI with a contrast-enhanced uh, uh, a contrast enhanced CT and a contrast enhanced MRI, you see striking differences. And here you see an example of an, uh, an neck tumor where I think it's not difficult to, to, uh, to establish that the demarcation of the tumor on this, on this scan would be much easier than on, on the CT. Some other example from esophageal cancer, where we also have a CT and a T2 weighted MR where again you see that MR is much better in de demarcating the tumor and actually for me as a physicist, because I'm a physicist, I also can see now suddenly there's actually an involved lymph node close to, to the aorta. So uh, you can even do more with MRI, as Ilya already uh, uh, illustrated. You can go, MRI is a very versatile contrast in addition to functional uh, to an anatomical contrast, you also can do functional contrast. And here I gave an example for prostate cancer where we use co contrast enhanced uh, MRI and diffusion weighted MRI to uh, de define within the prostate uh, the GTV, so the gross, gross tumor volume. And then this information is used to stereotypically boost those regions. So I think uh, in the latter of my presentation, I will focus on the use of MRI for radiotherapy and uh, I will touch upon some issues uh, in terms of workflow. Uh, so if you have combined imaging, because CT is still of course very important because it provides the electron density used for the planning, um, and it's the master, how do we use the MRI information in this workflow? What we do is that we register the MR to the CT through a registration step, and then this, these two sets of images, or, or could be even more, are then presented to the clinician. The clinician would do the delineation on MRI, and it's then automatically being transferred to the CT. And that is then the input for the planning process. Uh, and again, there's an, an, another step involved is, which is required for the position verification, either done on DRs or fiducial detection. In, 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 a, in case of this prostate example. But it's important to realize that the CT is still the master. 
Yeah, because the CT provides a lectern density. We are planning on that image. So it's a combined workflow. Now, if you want to use MRI for this, this workflow process, you have to do some specific adaptations to your scanning protocols. And I want to touch upon some of these. So this is the system we're using in Utrecht. It's the Philips Ingenia MRT system. Ilya already showed a little bit. I just want to highlight some things. It's important that it is white is available now, this 70 centimeters, because it allows scanning in RT position. It comes with a flat tabletop and positioning uh, lasers, and it comes with some dedicated exam cards. We use in 1.5 and 3T systems, and all our sites receive also our MR scanning. Then something about positioning devices for MRI. Uh, you, we need positioning devices, for example, for stereotactic brain radiation. Now, these devices also need to be there when we scan the patients. So these devices should be MR compatible and should not give large image distortions. So that's something you should have to check. But there are various commercial solutions out there. You should just check whether they are MR compatible or not. We should sometimes use coil bridges because we need coils, of course, which are detecting our MRI signal. And these coil bridges are there to make sure that these coils don't distort the body contour. And sometimes you have to be a bit inventive. Yeah? And I'm happy to now that Philips actually is facilitating this, but um, for example, in case of head and neck, where the patient has an immobilization device, regular diagnostic coils cannot be combined. They are not compatible. So you have to think about other coil solutions, and actually we, we experimented with the surface coils, and actually it gives excellent image quality. Now here, these, I put these images in, this is from the cervix, to illustrate a little bit what kind of image quality you can have, and what kind of soft tissue image quality you have. So I think you can see that, that it's very nice, the tumor it can be very nicely delineated on the structures, but not only that, also, we can uh, organize risks like the rectum can be nicely delineated, the bladder, but you also see involved lymph nodes very easily, which is much more difficult to do on CT. Again, I want to make the point that you cannot just use standard diagnostic protocols for radiotherapy purposes, because in, in diagnostics, they often do these type of scans that they have in one plane, they have an excellent resolution, but the other planes actually have quite coarse resolution. In radiotherapy, we want to have 3D isotropic resolution because we delineate in three planes, but also to get a good registration towards the CT. So we want actually something like this. So you really have to sit down with your, with your yeah, MR physicist to make sure that these protocols are up to your specific radiotherapy needs. This can be done, and actually Philips provides some, some example exam cards. This is what you can do then. You can see here a brain tumor with contrast-enhanced uh, MRI. You can see nicely how MRI can, can actually has isotropic resolution in, in, in three different planes, which you can then use for delineation purposes. Um, Ilya mentioned already something about diffusion-weighted MRI, yeah? measuring restriction of water molecules. And I think it's a very nice contrast. It's an endogenous contrast, so you don't have to give any contrast agent, it's just based on the water mobility of your, uh, of your free water in, in your tissue. The standard way of measuring diffusion is with a particular readout, which are called echo planar readout. And it's standard being used in diagnostics, but they are prone to distortion, especially when you have uh, air cavities nearby. Here you see that, this is the Standard MRI sequence that doesn't have the distortion. This is the diffusion-weighted MRI that has this distortion. You can see that it's completely shifted and deformed. You can do something about it. You can make a different readout, and then suddenly eh, you get a nice image without any distortions. And you see nicely the tumor lesion, and you even can make quantitative map of the apparent diffusion co coefficient, the ADC. So an example of what you have to do to, uh, to com comply with your radiotherapy needs in terms of geometric accuracy. And if you then compare to PET, for example, so here I compare the diffusion-weighted image 
to your left hand side with the pet you see an excellent match. Well, this is based on a contrast agent, of course. This is just based on an endogenous contrast. So, a bit on, on then wrapping it up in terms of sequence requirements, what you need. I just put here some, some points which I think is important. I don't go all through all of them. I just want to highlight that it's really the soft tissue contours of MRI that provides actually, I think, the gain. But then again, the MRI should be geometric accurate. And nowadays, with the current new generation of MRI scanners, that's no longer the problem. That can be done. What you always have to remind is in this workflow, you, you need a registration with your CT. So you need scans that allow good registration to your CT. Something on delineation. I think uh, as a clinician, potentially you get a lot of information which you have to delineate. And, uh, Normally in the past we did that on a treatment planning system, but actually we found out that we could not do, we could not use optimally the imaging because we only had, could use two modalities, for example. So we came up with our own solution and now we have sort of desktop solutions where we have uh, co-registered use of CT and MR and we could have various MR contrasts available and the clinician can, can just delineate behind his desk on any modality he or she wants and then it's automatically being transferred to the CT. So I think this is actually often a bit an overlooked step which you need to have in place to make use uh, in an optimal way for, of your imaging. Now, and of course, then as a clinician, you have to interpret these images. And that's not very easy. Eh? Radiologists do it all the time. But for us in radiotherapy, it can be a bit new. We are used to look at our CT images but MR imaging is, can be sometimes more difficult. And uh, in this slide, I made a distinction between different sites because actually for some sites it's fairly easy, while for other sites it's more complicated. I make a distinction between the prostate paradigm because there what you can do, MRI can achieve a very good tumor to background contrast, like here. You can actually see where the tumor is in the prostate and it's not too difficult to delineate these structures. We can see the prostate very nice with respect to the background, so also the prostate delineation we can do fairly easy. So you don't need a highly specialized radiologist in this case. But in the terms of the pancreas paradigm, that is difficult. Because although MRI is very sensitive, the specificity of MRI for, for tumor tissue and pancreas tissue is actually lacking a little bit. For example, if you have pancreatitis, you will also see a, a diffusion restriction. So there we really need a good human expert on this. So there we need a specialized radiologist. Now, some words on, on potential problems when using CT and MR. And it's not a perfect world. I, I will say, I honestly say that. For example, if you're overlaying the contours delineated on your MR to your CT, you see that sometimes they don't match. And it's of course natural to understand because they were scanned at two different time points. Uh, ideally, there are only uh, one or two hours in between, but it can be also some days in between. So what do you do? There's some ambigu ambiguity there. Do we go for the CT contour or do you go for the MR contour? And then you have to think, okay, where does this come from? It comes, of course, from a sort of random variation in setup of the patient. Maybe some more gas in the rectum, for example, for the prostate. That's always there, of course, also when we radiate. So if we would adapt a contour, delineate NMR, and we would adapt it to CT, what actually what we're doing, we are including a sort of random effect as a systematic larger prostate contour which of course is not the case. So a random error we turn into a systematic error. And I think it's not what we want. But of course it's very difficult. And a lot of clinicians also in our institute, they are tempted to adapt the contour to the CT. Another issue is of course the registration is never perfect. There could be some error. And for example in a prostate case, you often have one or two millimeters that just the registration doesn't match properly. 
So what would be a solution for this sort of ambiguity problem? Actually, I think what you should do is do all your denilation sounds strange on one modality. So I, I'm now going sort of bit against what, what we do now, CT and MR, but I think what you should look at is what is the critical step. And the critical step is the definition of the target volumes. That's the critical step. There is where your accuracy is determined in your simulation process. So you should choose the, the imaging modality that's most optimal for that, and I think it's the MR. Then, of course, the MR should provide information for the electron density to be used for dose planning. Can we do that? Now, then I come to MR only simulation. So how should it look uh, then? So we have somewhere the structures, yeah? the MR structures, and we need somewhere electron density. This should, this should be provided by, by MR. So this is what I call a pseudo-CT. Yeah? So it's information on electron density derived from MR. And how do we do that? Nah, I, I, let me go here. Oh yeah, this summary. Uh, I'm just looking how she would do that. So this is typically the, the, the imaging protocol we do. We do some functional MRI, we do some anatomical MRI, and what we now have to do is just add one scan in addition, which creates our pseudo CT MRI scan. And might potentially you also want for prostate an additional scan for fiducial detection, yes or no. So you only have to add five more minutes to your scanning protocol. You could spare a CT scan to the patient, you just have a bit of a longer exam in terms of for your MRI. And then the scan, this pseudo CT scan, we use actually the Philips MR cup method for that. And that's something Ilya already mentioned. That. So this is he's shown also. This pseudo CT MRI scan, which I call, provides three type of contrast. And it, Philips calls it the MR cup method, huh? attenuated, uh, uh, calculated attenuated correction. And it provides, uh, through various image processing steps, the final product is a, what, we, what I call a pseudo CT and that you can use for the dose planning. So in this way, we can eliminate the CT, we avoid the ambiguity in a delineation process, we save a patient an extra CT scan, it's easier to plan, yeah, because we only need to plan an MRI scan, we don't have to plan a CT scan, and somewhere where there's some space free on MR, an MR scan, it's just one scan. So we also, if you think in terms of wor workflow and efficiency of your workflow, this could be very effective. Now, this MR cut technique is now only available for prostate, but of course it's very attractive, and that's something what we uh, are uh, uh, investigating in Utrecht. So here's an example of a patient which we acquired with on uh, the CT and the corresponding MR cut of the same patient. Uh, this, of course, is a, a stratified CT, so it has only a number of tissue types, and these tissue types are then in this imaging processing step, they are segmented and then Hounsfield units are assigned. Note that the CT and MR always are a little bit different because they acquire the different time points. Now, of course, you can do the dose planning on the MR cut, like here, a five plant IMT plan. But the key issue, of course, if you want to use this, how accurate is this? How accurate can I calculate dose on a pseudo CTR on MR cut? And that's a question we had actually, because now I'm working on the clinical implementation of this method in our clinic, and our medical physicists tell me, okay, give me a number. How accurate is it? So I want to know how accurate it is compared to my golden standard CT planning. How do you do that? Well, of course, you can, uh, uh, you can register them. Oh, ah, sorry for that. Uh, you can register them, and then you evaluate your dose plan onto your MR cut. So the same beam plan, let's say, you evaluate it on an MR cut. You can look at dose volume histograms. Of course, you see a difference, but you want to know where does the difference come from. So what we did, actually, we came up with a sort of commissioning plan. So if you want to introduce that in clinic, what can you do to assess th these differences and where they arise from? So this is sort of like a bootstrap approach. 
What we do is we have our CT, and then we convert that into a stratified CT. A stratified CT is similar as to the MR cut. And then what we also did, we said, okay, we also can convert that into a bulk assignment where we just take the body contour into account and we assign water to this. We can do the same thing for the MR cut, yeah? and we can also do that in terms of water equivalent MR cut, where we just have the body contour in. And then we can do the dose. If, uh, what you're actually doing then, you are looking at different effects. So here you look at the effect of using heterogeneous electron density, and here you're looking at the effect of, instead of having a continuous range of Hounsford units, you have discrete Hounsford units. And then if you would start to compare in terms of dose, you see here the impact of daily differences in body contour. And here you would get, or actually through this step, you get something of what are the total differences. Now we did that, and here this is average over 14 patients in terms of for prostate cancer, for prostate IMT plans. Actually, if you look at the water equivalent uh, scans, the dose difference in terms of percentage is zero. That's also what you expect, right? because these body contours are just a random effect. Average over 14 patients should not give a difference, which actually means that MRI is also geometrically accurate. If you look at the differences in dose over 14 patients between the MR cut and the CT, yeah, it's 0.3%, we found out. So it's, it's, it's nothing. You know, interfraction differences are much bigger. So that actually gave, uh, gave us the, the, the confidence, actually, that this can be done with MR. So now, what we want to do for prostate, at least, is try to eliminate the CT. Because the critical, the critical task is the definition of the target volume, and that can be d better done on MR. Of course, you also can derive a uh, uh, DOR of the bony anatomy. Some, in some institutes, they use that for uh, position verification. And we're now also looking in ways, and then you can do that also to see here the gold fiducials with MR. So, concluding my first part, I think uh, I can state that MR has a very good soft, to, soft tissue contrast. It can really aid in the delineation of, of target volumes, which I think is the critical step in terms of accuracy of your whole simulation workflow. Uh, it makes sense to add MRI to CT planning. Then you get a combined uh, workflow, which is now standard in our, in our clinic. It works well, but I think it can be done even better. And um, that's why we go now towards an MR-only simulation workflow, at, at least for prostate. And that's something we are further on uh, investigating. Okay, this was the, the first talk. I'm just looking a little bit how I'm st and in time. Okay, I think I'm good. Um, if there are some questions already now, you, you're free to ask. Or we can do it at the end of the second presentation, which you prefer. Yeah, so a CT, of course, is very fast. Huh? You can do you scan in, in one or two minutes even. Huh? In MR, we scan uh, about three to four minutes to get to acquire this, uh, this, uh, this MR cut, this pseudo CT. So it's a little bit slower, but not too much. Thank you. If there are no further questions, I think I proceed to the second part here. Because I mentioned already something about uh, positioning. Eh? Positioning is, of course, very important to make sure your target is, is in location where your beam uh, focus, your cross point is. Um, we allow looking actually in Utrecht to different ways to solve this. And uh, for that also we're focusing on MR. And um, actually, I'm, I'm, now I'm targeting now actually this step. So we talked about this, uh, the delineation and, and dosing, but now we're, we're now moving towards guidance and targeting. And here, again, I think MR has very much to offer. 
I start again with this picture. Suppose you would have this picture available at the moment of treatment. So a patient is going to be treated, and you can make a scan, and you have all this information available. That you know, and then you can start to see, okay, the lymph nodes are here, the tumor is here, organ and risk are there, and you can make a plan at that moment based on that anatomy. Suppose you can do that. So it's not about replicating a plan 30 times. It's about making a plan, plan tailored to the anatomy of that day of that patient. Yeah. And we know that's needed, of course, because this is an example for cervix, but you see what kind of interfraction motion you can have in terms of cer for cervix. So this is done based on repeated scanning of patients, four patients here. And what you see here, animations, is the differences in cervical position and bladder position for different fractions. These are four patients. We did it by just repeated scanning these patients over several days. Now, to account for this motion in radiotherapy, we have made an invention that is margins. We just make a margin on our tumor structure to account for this uncertainty in principle we have. But then, of course, we are hitting healthy tissue. And we might underdose the tumor. There's another thing, of course, is called something called intrafraction motion. Especially in the abdomen, we have a lot of respiratory-induced motion, and that anatomy is never still. So here you see an example again with what MR can do to really follow and track this motion. And since it doesn't use any ionizing radiation, you can just repeat this over time. It doesn't matter. And you have the soft tissue contrast to track any point you want. So that actually was the rationale in Utrecht to start with thinking about how we can combine a linear accelerator with an MRI system. Because the MRI would be the, actually the ideal camera to look at anatomy. Not only statically, but also dynamically. Now, this is the, the concept of what we call the MRI accelerator, something we pioneered, so I think, uh, the first, I would come to that, but the first abstract we had of that was in 1999, from my boss, Jan Lagendijk. He came up with this uh, concept, and it's about uh, uh, an MRI system combined with a linear accelerator. And you have to, of course, then radiate through the MRI system. And that's quite an engineering challenge. Now, I want to, just some slides on saying something about what are the challenges. I not mention all of them, but that's some of the major ones. As I said, you have to transmit with your radiation through the MRI system. Well, the MRI system is not made of air, it's made of metal parts, eh? copper parts, uh, cryostat for the superconducting uh, coils. And potentially there's also another issue is that the magnetic field of the MRI system could couple to your accelerator. Now, how did we solve them? The first thing, the beam transmission, uh, what we did, we just shifted the coils a little bit. So this is the standard way of MRI coils. These are the superconducting coils that generate the magnetic field. And we just shifted them out a little bit. So we have a window where we can radiate through. We also made a cryostat that has a little bit reduced and more uni uniform gamma antenneration. And then also what we did is to solve the issue of the magnetic field. The MRI is very strong magnetic field. If you put, maybe you, some of you experienced that, of course, but if you would bring a ferromagnetic object, like parts on an accelerator, into an MRI room, you would, poof, it clashes against the MRI. So how, how do we solve that, let alone get a proper operation for your accelerator? Now, and then somebody from Philips came up with a very smart idea, uh, Johan Overweg from Philips Hamburg. He said, okay, wait on, we can just... Uh, just, just slightly modify here the design of the superconducting coils such that we get a sort of sweet spot here in the middle where the field is actually very low here. So this is outside the scanner and actually here you see that there's a sort of a local minimum magnetic field because of this geometrical layout of the superconducting coils where the field is almost zero. That's our sweet spot. There we put our accelerator. So that's where the accelerator is rotating through, through this sweet spot. So it doesn't feel the magnetic field of the MRI scanner.
Now, this is a bit uh, where we're standing now. So as I said, the first invention was in 1999. We had a lot of in silica uh, assessment of this design. And the first prototype was actually came in 2009, was installed in our department. It was a modified magnet, and we just had a fixed beam path along one angle to see whether indeed we could radiate through an MRI system. Then we added a rotating gantry to this, and we, we stepped on. See, would that give any problems? Turns out that we can rotate the gantry without any problems. And that actually was sort of a proof of principle. And together with Electa, which is the main lead on this, and Utrecht, uh, Utrecht and Philips, we have designed the third prototype. And I think it's in the next picture. Yeah, this is the, the prototype, I think two years ago, something like that, where you really see a more like towards clinical grade system, where you have the MRI, you have, you have the, the linear accelerator rotating, you have a rotating gantry, and it rotates along the MRI. And you see this is a very bulky machine. Do I want to be in as a patient in such a bulky machine? It seems like a sort of James Bond movie. But you will see that uh, uh, now it's much more patient friendly. This is now the current prototype of a machine. This is a clinical grade machine. And uh, it's called the Atlantic System. Uh, it's pioneered by Utrecht, Elector, and Philips, where Elector has the lead. These are some of the specifications. And here you see that as a patient, you don't see a large part of this huge machine. You don't see the rotating gantry. It's a quite, I think, elegant uh, uh, structure. Now, we're going to uh, do the first in man uh, experiments uh, uh, in about three to four months. A little bit later, maybe it depends a bit of the ethical, ethical uh, approval. And we're going to treat as a first step bone metastasis on this machine, just as a proof of principle. Can we do it safe? Is everything under control? So this is very, uh, it's, it's near to clinical introduction. After this whole path of more than 15, 16 years, we're now really in a unique position to do this. Uh, we're not the only one that's doing this, actually. Yeah, there are also other initiatives around the world. And uh, in, uh, in Edmonton, in Australia, and I also want to uh, highlight the, another commercial party that uh, is actually also doing this, called Meridian System from View A. And various sites in the world are using this system, although it's a, a lower magnetic field system. Oh, now I have again the problem. What can you do then? Well, the whole process that now that I showed before that took several days, yeah, the scanning of the patient, defining the structures, computerized planning, etc., etc., that took several days. We want to do in terms of minutes. So here you would have an MRI, you define the structures, and then you have to calculate for that anatomy a certain plan, a beam plan. We have modified the planning system that we can do this in terms of minutes. So it's actually, we, using modern computing, you can bring this back from several hours to, into several minutes. And this will, will increase, and this reduction will go on, of course. So time is not an issue anymore there. And then actually, we can do delivery. So this can be a process of, of several minutes. And then you have a beam plan that's really tailored to the daily anatomy as you see. What can you do in terms of clinical applications is? Well, this is something what we want to pursue in the next years. What you can do, and there was a discussion here in the last session about lymph nodes, eh? boosting lymph nodes. I think this machine is ideal actually to do that. Now, lymph nodes are often involved as a strong negative prognostic factor in many cancers. But lymph nodes now are located mainly on CT, based on anatomical boundaries. And what we do is we create a sort of elective field. So we immerse a large package of lymph nodes with a large field. But we can treat this much better if you could see them. And how do we do that? Well, here's even an example of lymph nodes. We make a movie of MRI. You can see very nicely the lymph node in auxiliary here. So MRI can really see those lymph nodes, one by one by one. Now, if you think about that then, maybe I'll go back. You can see once more. Here's a movie there you see coming them. And often these lymph nodes and auxiliary are involved in breast cancer. And what we want to do actually 
is to, okay, suppose we have this patient on MLENAC, we do first a scan, uh, we localize where the lymph nodes are, so we do a soft tissue tracking, a localization of the lymph nodes, nothing with fiducials, only based on soft tissue. See, okay, these are the lymph nodes, and we want to stereotactically boost them. We calculate a plan on the fly, and we re-evaluate them. That's something which can be done, and it's not far ahead. What we also can do is we can, of course, deal completely with motion. This is, of course, uh, what's now the case in pancreas, for example, you have a tumor. And to account for the respiration-induced motion, we use an ITV. Because as you see, that our, our dose distribution is much bigger than needed, in principle. So we have unwanted dose, for example, to the duodenum, that we can... Oh, I'll go again, sorry for that. No. So we have unwanted dose, for example, for example, to the duodenum. To avoid this uncertainty, eh, because the, since we have this uncertainty, we, we include this margin, we have to need a camera. We need a camera that can track the motion. An MRI can do this. And, uh, so here you see repeated MRI images of respiratory-induced motion in the abdomen, in the coronal plane. I don't know if we can... Could you start up this movie here? Because where we can do additional processing on this, you see that if we do image registration, we can, make the, we can track the motion in each point of the anatomy. So we not only have anatomical motion, but we also have motion information on each point. We have a virtual fiducial on each point. So we can track not only the tumor, but we also can track all anatomy, including the organs risk. No, this goes. Now, you can also do this uh, uh, in 3Ds, and that's something we're working on now. And then you see, for example, you can just pick out a point. This is the pancreatic motion over the respiratory mo uh, cycle, and you can see how much it moves. Now, uh, some last words. This is not an alone effort, of course. Uh, we started this up with great help from Lecter and Phillips. But to really disseminate it clinically, we need other partners. And that's why uh, there was a nice consortium being formed, international support uh, consortium, where we're going to develop the treatments for this MLEDAC machine. It's called the Atlantic uh, Consortium. The system is called the Atlantic MR Guided RT System. And then various sites are, are uh, uh, involved. The MD Anderson Institute, another site, AVL in Amsterdam, Milwaukee, Toronto, London, Royal Marsden, and Christie. And in the coming years together, we're going to develop new treatments using this machine. Uh, Electra is expecting that actually that this, this, this can be uh, the system. It will be probably commercially available 2017, 2018. But in the meanwhile, we're going to work with these sites. And all, I think the majority of these sites have just recently received an MR Linux, so now they also have this machine available at this, uh, their site. Now, last word on closing the circle. Yeah, I mentioned already, okay, we did this, we can do this, but let's also follow the disease, how it progress. Again, an example using MRI, this is a esophageal cancer. And esophageal cancer, in Holland, we do neoadjuvant chemo radiation. So prior to surgery, it's a major uh, uh, surgery, we do chemo radiation to shrink the, the tumor volume. What we saw is actually that about 20% of these patients already had a complete response due to this chemo radiation. So you can consider to, uh, pro to apply a wait and see policy for these patients and just to extend the surgery, not do it yet. But you have to select this patient at four ends. And how do you do that? You can do that again with MRI. So here you see an example, patient example has a large esophageal tumor mass here. And over the course of the chemo radiation, we tracked its response. Not only with the anatomical, anatomical T2 information, but also can do the diffusion weighted imaging. And so, sometimes you see completely that the tumor regresses and it's complete response. For these patients, you can think, okay, I apply a wait and see policy. 
and you can of course track these and follow up these patients over time. So, conclusion, my last slide. Um, yeah, there's a lot of MRI in, but we really have a philosophy free that radiotherapy should go MRI. Not only in the simulation, in the imaging, but also in the guidance and the treatment uh, follow-up. There will always be room for CT, because CT has some key advantages in terms of speed or robustness. Um, but with, I think actually that, uh, uh, that, there are, that there's still there's a major potential for MRI. And um, especially I'm very, uh, I'm very enthusiastic what MRI-guided RT can do. And I think it will change really how we deal with uncertainty in the radiotherapy process and enabling other clinical applications we did not envision uh, before. That being said, I would like to thank you. I have, of course, this is the work of many people. Uh, I have an acknowledgement slide. Oh, this is a, maybe yeah, I forgot to include this. This is our current situation in our institute. And um, uh, you see uh, the accelerators with cone beams in. And then this is something what my professor Jan Langdijk always shows. This is the current MRIs we have in our radiotherapy institute. And he's and then, oh, I'm sorry, it doesn't go? No, maybe it doesn't work, but now we have seven MRIs in our system, in our institute, and we're going towards 10 MRIs in our system. So you can see the commitment we have towards this uh, research line. And then, that being said, now I really put in my acknowledgement slide, it's the work of many, many people. We have a big research effort in Utrecht, and uh, also a lot of support from, uh, from industry, from Electra, and also from Philips, and that is enabling really the translation of this work. And, um, I invite you uh, for any questions, if you have them, and I uh, will thank you for your uh, attention. Thanks a lot for a very interesting presentation. Any questions, please? It's impossible to combine a linear accelerator and MRI, but now we are well looking forward. Uh, I have some technical questions. The first one is about the intra-fractionation imaging. How long does it take to make an image? And so, how much seconds does it take to, to cut one slice? Yeah. It's a good question, excellent question. Um, if MRI is, of course, a bit slower than CT, but um, with the newest techniques, we can make a 2D image in about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 seconds. And uh, so I think that that's, that's the time speed you need to expand this to 3D, so we really have a large coverage. That's, of course, the challenge, because we don't want to only track the tumor, we want to also see the organ at risk. But I think we can do that. Uh, you see there's a lot of innovation in MRI in terms of image acceleration, and I think uh, people have shown that they can get 3D volumes in less than a second. So if talking about pelvis to the image, less than a second, we can get a real-time imaging. Yeah, yeah, I think we can go there, yeah. And then the pelvic, of course, I think the motion is of a lower temporal, uh, temporal scale, but for, for abdomen, you would need something like that, yeah. Uh, thank you. And the second question about, um, also about time, you said that uh, maybe in the future it will be the question of minutes. Of the, about the triggering the patient, so but you have told nothing about you have said nothing about um, contouring. Yeah. How how do you use it? Do you use some software yeah, for the, the, auto segmentation for organ risk for yeah. the target and how long does it take? Yeah, that's a very excellent question. I think these workflow issues are actually essential, and uh, I know I know people that they already use the view ray system, as yeah, that they actually it can increase the, the time you have to spend on, on contouring. So you make a scan, and now you have to do, of, of course, the contouring. At the moment, it's done manually. And that's, of course, a lot of work. Uh, we're looking at ways to, to propagate contours, which we did at forehand, propagate to, the, to them to the scan we require at the moment of treatment. And you see in the image processing, there's a lot of activity going towards automatic contouring using machine-learned approaches. And uh, people have shown a lot of results there. And I think we should try to transfer those, those uh, let's say, results for this problem. At the moment, I think you're completely right that, uh, that th this is still the, the bottleneck. Yeah, but I think it can be addressed.
Yeah. Thank you. And the last question, um, there are not much information about MR Linux, and do you still work with dummies, or do you acquire patients now? Nowadays? At the moment, you mean? Yes, at yes. the moment. Yeah, at the moment, we are preparing the first clinical trial with this machine, so um, uh, that's the... Uh, Electa has, has now installed a clinical system in our department. We are commissioning that at the moment, and we are preparing for the clinical trial. And uh, we expect that, it, depending on the ethical approval, that uh, it will be probably be half a year before we start with the clinical trial. And we start with the bone mats uh, uh, patients. And, uh, but uh, you see that the other sites that also received the MLNR, they have a lot of uh, ongoing activity, and, and probably you will see them also starting within a year or so on the first clinical trials. Thank you very much. Yeah.